Long Street, we repaved it, we cleaned up the buildings, we curated the tenants. You went to Woodstock after that. So we ran out of things to buy in, in town. What's up guys, my name is Craig Yates and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with Craig. We are here at the beautiful Kurt Constantia, the oldest wine farm in the country, the first property development. And saying that, we are going to be hearing from a property developer, someone that started developing Longstreet, Woodstock, the Biscuit Mill, the River Club, he's even gone and bought an airport. We are going to be talking to Nick Ferguson, an amazing property developer, and he's going to teach you his entrepreneurial journey, what he's been through, and what you need to do to ensure that you become successful as an investor in property, as an entrepreneur. So if you haven't yet, make sure to like this video, make sure to subscribe, make sure to hit the notification bell, because you want to be notified when all these episodes come out. We have some amazing guests, and this guest is just one of those people. So Nick, thanks for thanks for joining us on Coffee with Craig. I know we've we've come and chatted to you before at your house about almost like learning from you and everything you've done inside of in your properties and your property investments and your businesses. And I think you're someone that's really inspiring for young entrepreneurs. So I would love to share with my audience what you've been through as an entrepreneur and a, a property investor and what people can learn from you. So I mean, where for you, where did it all actually start? It started. Um, yeah, a number of years ago. Actually, I've always been thinking about doing my own business. I collected bottles and um, filled them with seawater and shipped them up to Joburg and sold seawater in, in, in the townships. That business didn't last long. I was doing my articles at the time, so I didn't have a, a lot of time to, to, to dedicate it. Mm. Um, I was studying part-time, okay. so um, I was doing my BCom through Nisa while I was doing articles, so you know, it was work during the day, study at night. And then, uh, and then after that, did you get into the, the corporate world or did you always go and do something by yourself? So I left, I left uh, articles in, well, I finished articles in 90, I finished GDA in 95 and um, because I'd already finished articles, I wrote the board and I went straight overseas. But uh, no, I mean, you were South African, going overseas to London and starting a business. Is that, how, how easy is that? That can't be easy, I'm sure. It's, uh, it's not too difficult. Okay. It's not too difficult, you know. Obviously, <laughs> yeah, difficult is relative. You know, again, we had to work, you know, we worked during the day in our normal jobs mm. and, and you know, started this thing part-time to have to, to made enough money to support you know, at least one of us. And then, so, so yeah, it's, that's how it started. And then uh, you know, I went into I had a nightclub in London uh, under the railway arches with, with uh, my ex girlfriend's brother. Okay. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> that's what everyone, every young guy wants yeah, to do. Yeah, it's all those things. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> it. So it's, 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 everything's relative to your stage in life. You know where you are personally. You know. You often find um, women who have, ch have children, babies, where they're all wanting to get into mm. baby businesses mm. and they think the market's underserved or something. So, so yeah, so we had a nightclub and I imported wine into the UK, uh, a couple of labels from South Africa. Um, and then I left London in uh, 99. I came here uh, you know, not knowing many people, you know, a couple of people, and I. Um, I started a call center, it evolved into a call center. There's a business called um, 0800 to fix it. So you, okay. so you, so you, dial, you dial this number, 0800, the number to fix it, and you basically tapped into a network of approved contractors. How amazing is this place? The first property ever developed here in South Africa, in Cape Town. Simon van der Staal's original house. We had to break the episode up to show you this because how can we talk about property development if we don't speak about Simon van der Staal's house? If you haven't yet, come to the museum, come check it out. Now, back to the show. 
So one of the one of the one of the clients of the call center introduced me to a mail order business. I decided to leave the call center. To, to do that. I sold my shares, got pretty much nothing for it. Mm -hmm. um, the call center went on to list. It had when I left, it had like 50 staff, something, and, and they grew to like 2,000 staff. And after you left, yeah, after I left. <laughs> after I left, and they and they acquired businesses, and they just you know they went hell for leather, and they they actually grew too fast. Okay. They grew too fast that they couldn't actually manage it there, and the whole thing imploded. In my experience, you know, your your most important thing is is cash flow. Yeah. You know, Profits, profits are you know obviously nice to have, but if you can't manage your cash flow and you can't pay your creditors, you know a lot of businesses blow because they can't manage that growth. So I mean, this is still early on in your career, so you're learning lessons the whole yeah, time. Yeah, learning lessons. And now I'm sure when you left and they then listed, that did that spark something in you to want to go and make something even bigger? Um, or did you just move on to the, no, to the next venture? No, moved on to the next thing. Yeah, I think that you know, in life you can't, you, know, you don't own it realistically. As I always say, um, success or anything in life, you rent and you never own it because you have to, just like going to the gym, you have to keep going to the gym every single day. You can't just go to the gym once and then get fit and healthy and then expect yeah, life so good. Right. And business is like that. Yeah. Um, business, you have to be working, especially if the owner of a business, 24 hours a day forever. Sure. Uh, it, never, it never ends, as opposed to an employee that goes home at five o'clock. Yeah. So, so after that, after the, the call center, what did you go on and do? So we went and bought a mail order business. Um, we, a South African guy, a successful South African guy, had immigrated to America. Um, he had a South African mail, mail order business, and we had, a, we had expanded these mail order businesses around the world. Okay. And we flew over to, you know, we were like twenty. To 29, flew over to the States to Saddlebrook in, in Florida. Um, yeah, just happened to catch him at the perfect time. His son had just won some tennis tournaments. So, so you know, a lot of these things is also timing. Good timing. Uh, like timing and luck like, is also, yeah, mm. it's not all hard work. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and we bought the business from him and we then had to come back and you know, we had some money but we didn't have enough to pay for it. So we had to go and raise money, you know, with investors to help pay for it. And I think, you know, their people, you know, when you speak to people, my experience is that you, if you, if they believe what you, what you're saying, and you know, you're sincere, and yeah. you convey that you will fulfill on your word, you know, people will back you. That's essentially, so we, we, we bought the business, um, we eventually bought out our, our, you know, the, our initial investors, bought them out, um, and then with the money there, we started buying property. Okay. Is that when you started getting involved in Long Street? That's when we started. Okay. And then again, we're back to what we loved at the time was bars, nightclubs. Bars, nightclubs. So, okay. Yeah, okay. So we, and why, why Long Street? Because most people would have thought Long Street, I don't want to go there, I don't want to touch that, I don't want to invest there. And you guys went there. Well, at the time, Long Street, yeah, Long Street was run down. It was, but, you know, I remember having driven past um, uh, you know, a shopping center nearby seeing and, and thinking about how how a shopping center works you know they curate the tenants they know the market they know um, you know all the ins and outs of, of you know who wants to be in there and, and it would be no no difference in a street you know and that was our logic you know we could create a, a, a vibe in a street and if we put enough of the same type of tenants we're going to attract people to the street okay. we did Long Street, we repaved it, we cleaned up the buildings, we curated the tenants and it changed the, it changed the street. Everything changed. Yeah, it changed yeah. And then you, you almost went on and then you tried to find something else that was very difficult. You went to Woodstock after that. So we ran out of things to buy in, in town and came across a property in Woodstock and, and went there and, and just, you know. And, and was this the, the biscuit mall? Yeah, it was the biscuit mall. So, just, you know, we also didn't overanalyze things. You know, you can analyze things to, you know, I think what happens is if you end up overanalyzing, you'll talk yourself out of it. You don't you, actually end up doing it. Yeah. yeah. 
because so uh, you know we went there and we looked at the scale of the buildings. We just said, you know, how big is the site? Mm. Well, how big are the buildings? You know, surely this you know, just seems to. You know, obviously we did numbers mm. and we were both accountants and yeah, uh, but but practically, you know, if you, if you put a crate of beers and you sit on the side of the <laughs> chair, <laughs> you'll come up with a solution. And, you know, I think if you overthink things. You, and I, I think that's a that's a difficult thing for for young people wanting to get into investing because mm -hmm. they almost they're scared because they don't know what they don't know just yet. Mm -hmm. And I mean, almost by chatting to you, it almost sounds like just go and do it and learn yeah. along the way. I mean, I can only talk from my experience, yeah. but 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 um, yeah, people were people were told me you would have to have, you know you have to have elaborate business plans and you know, documents and pages. And, you know, in real life, it doesn't work like that. Because it's such a it's such a fluid thing. It's constantly changing. You know, something yeah, generally when you get in and if you're ambitious and motivated and industrious, you'll make a plan. Uh, but you know, if you spend you know, months writing a business plan, you know, and then something like COVID yeah. hits and it was completely you know, out like the window. Manage your cash flows. You know, wouldn't you know? Do things on intuition a lot. Obviously, do some, you know, some numbers, but don't get bogged down in the market. And, and, you know, if you think you can do it, you know, it's like riding a mountain bike. If you if you're riding a mountain bike and you look at a stone, you're gonna hit the stone. It's, it's where you look is where you're gonna yeah, go. You gotta look at the path. Yeah, you look at the path. The look around I mean, the corner. I mean, that's, it seems like you've done that because you always look for the next big, big thing and also something that's quite challenging. So, yeah. I mean, uh, you did quite a lot of things in Woodstock, so it wasn't just Biscuit Mall, you've done some other property developments. And then, I mean, where, where, did, you go, where did you go next after that? Uh, after Woodstock, mm -hmm. we, started doing, we started doing more in Woodstock, so we bought the Woodstock Exchange. Um, we, did a, you know, we did a development there. Again, it's about curating the tenants, making sure you create communities. That's, you can easily poison these communities, and those, that applies to you know, most businesses. You can you can be you can be chasing a quick buck, but you, know, if you, you might get the quick buck, but you'll compromise you know the long term growth. You know, in a property in, 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 in our properties, you know, ours are all you know, in Woodstock generally are creative creative tenants. So, um, you know, if I go put a second hand cell phone shop there. It's not the one. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like the, the apple that will poison the, yeah. the entire basket. A lot of people also when they when they uh, a business owner or they become an entrepreneur they do it because they think if it's up to them they're gonna succeed and they don't want anyone else. And in, in business you need to work with other people, you need to collaborate and uh, I mean you don't you've got you've got strengths and weaknesses. It's For only sure. important to find someone that fulfills your weakness. Um, and you've always worked with partners. So we've, I've always had, I've had one business partner, you know, for my entire career. Right? And, and was that a friend that you it was a that friend, you grew up with? <coughs> no, it was a friend I met in, in London, um, and we've done everything together you know, since then. Um, for a number of years, it was just us, and then we, you know, when we bought the River Club, we, you know, the scale of it is too big for us to do. We couldn't. We couldn't so we, we looked for big development partners and you know, we went out and we happened to find the best in the industry in the same prop. Uh, and they are being fantastic. And I mean and with your partner you've always also been very creative. You haven't just gone and bought a building and then just sat. You've always done something to the building. Yeah, we've so always you've had daddy is it daddy's yeah, deal? So we, 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 we had we had we've got the daddy brand um, which started out as a building in Long Street. Where we bought it and we didn't actually know what we were going to do with it. it was again intuition is like uh, I think it's worth it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then we we created a, a boutique hotel, backpack hotel, hotel. We sort of took different roles. So I, I did the basketball and the Woodstock Exchange. Jody did the Daddy brand, which was the Granddaddy and the Old Mac Daddy. Um, there was just too much to do together, so we would you know, collaborate and work, but we. we Work together, but we couldn't do everything together. And initially, we started doing everything together, and you know, in time, we're still equal partners. But we 
we're doing different things. Slightly different yeah. things. And yeah, so now, now, we, now, we, now, airport. now we bought, we bought uh, an airport, okay. um, which is, a, it was, a, or is, or was called the Fusanta Kral. Um, it was an old military airport built in 1943. We, you know, we saw the value in that airport you know, for a number of reasons, but you know, one is the you know, airports essentially are monopolies. Mm. You know, you, 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 there's not a lot of them around. In fact, mm. in, in, in South Africa, they're all monopolies. In South Africa, it's an absolute monopoly. Okay, okay. You know, every airport is, is, there's one privately owned significant airport. And, and Krugel and Pumla. Okay. Because um, now people keep saying... So and Lanceria. So Lanceria. Because people yeah. are saying this is almost like the Cape Town version of Lanceria. I mean, do you think it will become uh, like that? Is that I the think, vision? I think the, 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 they, say the, they say it'll be the Lanceria of Cape Town because it'll be a second airport. Mm. But it's going to be different to Lanceria. It'll be very different. Yeah, it's different. Okay. You know, they, people are likening it to Lanceria because Joburg's got two airports. Mm. But, but London's got five airports. And Barcelona's got three. Mm. You know, Cape Town needs two airports. No doubt about it. And what, I mean, what is the what is the vision with the airport? How how do you foresee it? So initially, it'll be the general aviation hub for for the Western Cape. Okay. And general aviation is everything other than commercial aviation. Um, you know, well, it, there is obviously a little bit of an overlap. Um, general aviation would include. You know, fixed base operators, which is you know, who, who, who manage charters and, and private planes, and private plane owners, crop sprayers, maintenance organizations, helicopters, um, drones, which is an hour thing, coming mm. in, you know, drones with, with short distance travel. Not, not, not drones that you, you know, when you say drone, when you say airports, everyone thinks passenger airports. Mm. When you say drones, everyone thinks, you know, just yeah, playing around with think a little, little helicopter drone. Yeah. The drones are like the drones are now big fixed wing you know, drones that are big, they're so small aeroplanes that take four hundred and fifty kilograms to take it two thousand kilometers. So it's yeah, you know, it's the whole world has changed. So I mean you've always been entrepreneur your whole career and you've always invested in property. Why why did you want to start putting money into a, a fixed asset like property and why here in South Africa? It's, I got into property because it's you know, it's it's something tangible. You know, it's, not, it's something that you can see and feel and touch. Um, it's something that you know historically has grown every. You know, it's, it's like a rolling snowball. Mm. You know, it just grows and keeps you know, keeps up its momentum. Um, South Africa is we did it because we lived in South Africa. We focused only on Cape Town. Far from your assets is close to your losses. Okay. Which so I mean, you, you had a rule that you should always invest within 20 minutes from from your office or your yeah, home. Yeah, we try to. We, you know, we had a few rules to start. We didn't want. We wanted. You didn't want to lift in a building because that was mm, you know, additional extra we, costs. Uh, we wanted. You know, we, we like the heritage buildings, you know, which have these you know, these intrinsic values that you can't really you know, put a value to but it's mm. yeah you, know, you can't replace them so it's you know, and they're beautiful they you know like the environment we're in now mm. so um, thank and you, you saw to I mean, for, for putting us up <laughs> <laughs> and and you um you're still very i mean going and starting a project like an airport is a long-term project i mean People now in South Africa, there's a lot of people that are wanting to immigrate. I mean, do you still see a lot of hope and a lot of growth here in the country? Uh, I see a lot of opportunity. That's, you know, if you're willing to roll your sleeves up, there's opportunity here that you, you would never get overseas. Yeah, if I was living in Europe or in America, yeah, do you think I would have bought an airport? No. <laughs> well, do you, I mean, do you think you would have been able to do any of those projects if you weren't here in entrepreneur South Africa? I mean, if you look at the, the wealthiest South Africans, and, and Rob will tell you about this, you know, the wealthiest South Africans are not living in South Africa. Yeah. You know, the, you know, Elon Musk, I saw, is sitting at $200 billion. He's the wealthiest person in the world. Yeah, he, and he, he's my age. He left when he was 21. So he, he, in 29 years, has gone from nothing 
to the wealthiest person in the world. You cannot do that. Either. It's impossible. Okay. Okay. You can't. So Nick, with all the experience and all the projects that you've worked on, I mean, if you had to go back and speak to your younger self when you were 25 years old, I mean, what tips could you give yourself of what you've learned now? On the so, so the difference between residential property and commercial property is residential is subjective. You know, some people look at it and they say they think they can make it, whereas commercial property is objective. Um, if you can add for high level, for every one rand rent you add per month, you're adding a hundred rand to the value okay. of the property. So a hundred times ballpark. You know, if you take I'm one increasing the rent. Yeah, increasing the value of the property. Okay. And if you think you've got a property and you can now take add a hundred rand rent, you're adding ten thousand rand mm. to the value. So you just gotta think like that. You know, how much where can I how, how can I get an extra you know, money out of the building? And, it, and it's So how can I increase the cash flow? Increase the cash flow. So one rand rent is a hundred rand value. Value, okay. Ballpark. So being creative, because you can't just sit and wait no, for appreciation. No, no, no. You, you have to go and you obviously actually you have develop. to have, you know from a commercial property perspective, you have to have contracts. You have to have agreements with people. Because mm -hmm. you know, the banks look at those agreements. Yeah, it's not they and they make sure you're collecting on those agreements. So the banks are also a big part. Yeah, the banks are the are massive. So it's not, and it's not just about your own balance sheet. About going out and investing. No, you need you need a you need a financial partner. So how would a how would a young person start in property development or wanting to invest in commercial property? Is it possible for them to actually just start? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, I, I would. If I was starting again, I would I would go buy a little a corner cafe type thing. Um, go spend you know less than a million rand. Okay, so something small, just yeah, start. Just start. A, just start with something small. Okay. And remember that you know, you have to increase the rents. You know, every one rand is a hundred rand. So find start some, small. Find something small. Yeah. Add value. Be creative and start trying to increase the the rent. If you increase the value, obviously you're paying off capital. So you're paying off capital as you know, your debt is going down, your value is going up, and you can access that difference. And you can put it into the next one. So there we have it, another episode of Coffee with Craig where we hear from a creative property developer. Nick Ferguson has shared with us how to be creative, how to add value, how to become successful if you're wanting to get involved as a property investor here in Cape Town when so many people think it's not possible. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. Next week, we have a returning guest. So if you need a little bit of motivation, this guest is gonna come back after his kidney transplant and how he's recovered. And he's gonna share with us how he's recovered and what you can do to get through any tough time in your life because we all go through tough times. So that's one you don't wanna miss. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like this video, hit the notification bell, share it with a friend. Until next week, we're out of here.